So, after Fear and Desire, all Stanley Kubrick had to show for his work was a movie he was too embarrassed to keep in theaters, and the looming threat of unemployment. Fun. That didn't discourage him, though. Far from it. If anything, getting his tiny, no-budget movie made and distributed at all just incensed him to dive headlong into another better project. Still, with money a growing concern, his goal this time around was going to be to make a movie that appealed to a wider audience, hopefully getting him more widely noticed in the process. To that end, Kubrick and his screenplay writer from Fear and Desire, Howard Sackler, worked to create a new script that drew on the hard-boiled crime fiction of the 1940s, the kind of stuff that appealed to a cynical, post-war audience with its boundary-pushing violence and sex. Oh, it's so sexy. The biggest influence at play for the script was undoubtedly Mickey Spillane, author of the hugely popular and ultra-gritty Mike Hammer detective novels. Kubrick couldn't get enough of Spillane's dark and cut-to-the-chase style, and more importantly, he knew that the general public just lapped the stuff up to. So of course, to Kubrick, imitating Spillane and other creators like him seemed like a natural choice. Why not? That said... Kubrick also ended up saddling Sackler with a whole list of major set pieces he wanted included in the story, either because they were about passions of his, or they were thrilling action scenes that he could imagine taking place within walking distance of his own apartment. You know, a boxing match, a chase across the rooftops of New York, seduction at a dance hall, fight in a clothing warehouse, that kind of disparate list of things. Basically, imagine the writing process for something like Axe Cop, a comic written by a little boy and illustrated by his adult brother, and you can probably imagine the writing process for this script. Hey Howard, hey Howard, want to hear my story idea? Sure, Stanley, fire away. So there's this boxer? Okay. And a dancing girl who lives next door? Sure. And the dancing girl's dating an old man! Yeah? And the boxer and another boxer punch each other really hard for a really long time and it's really cool! Wait, no, what does that have to do with- And then the old man does some bad stuff to the girl, but the boxer saves her! And then he creeps on her. Okay. And then there's a part where this other really, really pretty dancer, who's also my wife, dances ballet and is really, really awesome and symbolic and stuff. Uh... And then the old man and the boxer chase each other on the rooftops! Uh-huh. And then they get to a warehouse, and they, they, uh, they hit each other with, uh, uh, mannequins! Yeah, mannequins! You, that's great, right? Make sure you have that part last a really, really long time, too, because that's going to be the super best, most awesome, amazing part of the movie, and absolutely no one will get tired of it! How much sugar have you had today, Stanley? A little... <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> Sackler did what he could with Kubrick's list of demands and created a script called Kiss Me, Kill Me, later retitled Killer's Kiss. He ended up refusing to have his name on the project, not wanting it to ruin his chances of becoming a serious writer. That should tell you pretty quickly the level of story you should expect going into this one. It's... Like the man said, can happiness buy money? Well, you're a comedian too. Uh... She was a witness. I thought you were dead. They grabbed her and made it look like she packed up and left. I, I thought you were dead. Yeah. To me, you're just an old man. You smell bad. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of interest on display in Killer's Kiss. The cinematography is the main thing here. Remember those really expressionist looking shots from Fear and Desire? There are plenty more like them here, with the urban environment providing lots of opportunities for Kubrick to play with angles, Lines, shadows, mirrors, and most importantly, symmetry. I haven't seen a huge chunk of Kubrick's filmography yet, but one thing I do know about the man is that he f loves symmetry. This is most apparent in his trademark use of what's called one point perspective symmetrical, tube-like compositions which lead the eye towards a single vanishing point in the center. There are at least two examples of this kind of shot in Killer's Kiss, including this high-angle shot in a staircase with an ironic sign hanging over the focal point, and this dream sequence of a long, narrow street flying by which seems to anticipate the Stargate shots in 2001 A Space Odyssey. We'll be analyzing the function of one-point perspective shots in more films as we progress, 
For now, seeing these compositions here is mainly interesting because we're seeing Kubrick beginning to build one of the signature strokes of his style. And that's cool. Other cool things of note in this movie include... 1. The music by Gerald Freed, who helps Kubrick create a fittingly ambiguous soundscape where the difference between the music of the film world and the music of the score is not always clear. Two, echoes back to Day of the Fight. There are similar shots of ads for boxing matches in both films, and the matches themselves are shot very similarly, with the camera in Killer's Kiss also getting to go inside the ring and bring a new level of intensity and craft to the table. It's really, really good. And three, the aforementioned ballet scene, which should seem out of place since it is literally just an excuse for Kubrick to show off his wife but it really ends up being the high point of the entire film, both in terms of cinematography and storytelling. It's beautiful, haunting stuff. And it's during this non-literal flashback scene that Killer's Kiss feels most like a fully realized Kubrick film. Which is great, because so much of the rest of the film really doesn't feel that way. Like I said earlier, the script is all over the place. Many scenes don't seem to have a point, or are obviously just there as part of Kubrick's list of arbitrary set pieces. The last leg of the film in particular feels really confused, no doubt as a result of ongoing rewrites. Lead actress Irene Kane, aka Chris Chase, wrote this telling message to her sister during production. We have shot a bunch of endings for this plate of hash, and by now I don't know if I'm a bad guy or a good guy. There's one version where I kill the villain, there's another version where I try to seduce him, and there's been more killing and resurrection than you'll find in the Bible. I don't know if she actually sounded like that, but that's the only voice I could come up with. On top of that, several major sequences go on far longer than they ought to, particularly the supposed to be climactic but actually kind of awkward mannequin fight, which at least one audience is said to have laughed their pants off at. Fun fact! Inspiration for this scene was likely drawn from the Girl Hunt ballet sequence in Vincente Minnelli's The Bandwagon. Pro tip, Stanley. When a broad Hollywood musical has more convincing fights between its hard-boiled protagonist and gangster villains, you know you're probably doing something wrong. All that said, the thing that's dragging this film down the most, though, has got to be the dubbing. Good du- Ugh. Like Fear and Desire, the entire film was post-dubbed. No onset sound ended up being used. But Killer's Kiss ends up even worse for wear than that film did. There are loads of instances of lip movements that don't really match the spoken dialogue. If, if only you could know how alone and worthless I feel. I didn't even know you had any feelings. Oh, you foolish girl. Many of the performances are flat and rushed. But she agreed to come out to Seattle with me. I should have had sense enough, though, to know that it was no good. And she was so scared she'd grab at anything. But I was kidding myself, and all I could think of was how much I wanted her. And due to Kane refusing to spend another second on the project once filming wrapped, her entire role was redubbed by Peggy Lobin, whose vocal delivery doesn't mesh well with Kane's expressions and body language. Listen, Finn. Don't kill me. I don't want to die. I'll do anything you say. Anything. You love him, though, don't you? I don't know. I don't think so. On top of all that, all the sound effects were cut in personally by Kubrick himself, which is major respect points for the amount of effort that took, but there are many times when effects like footsteps or punches or crashes are so cheap sounding or badly mixed or artificially spaced out that it becomes a point of distraction. You went down that!
Real talk, a big part of what makes noir films work is that for all their hard-boiled cliches and stylized cinematography, there is something genuine in the weary, hardened performances of the actors that taps into the very real feelings of depression and frustration that many American people felt after the war. And yet, Keys, as I was walking down the street to the drugstore, suddenly it came over me that everything would go wrong. I couldn't hear my own footsteps. It was the walk of a dead man. Killer's Kiss lacks that genuineness. Whatever the reasons for it, the actors and sound effects in the movie are very fake. And that, combined with some of the other amateurish moments, is what most contributes to its failure as a serious piece of cinema. Had Kubrick been able to pay proper sound people to, I don't know, help him energize and direct actors during dubbing, or spread out the work of cutting in effects and whatnot, then maybe this issue might not have flared up as badly as it does. As it stands, well, there you go. There would be more money for his upcoming projects, at least. United Artists bought Killer's Kiss for $75,000, which was just enough to cover production costs and pay back delayed salaries to everyone that Kubrick had promised money to. The finished film was, again, a major disappointment to Kubrick in hindsight, who later said, While Fear and Desire had been a serious effort and eptly done, Killer's Kiss proved, I think, to be a frivolous effort done with uh, conceivably more expertise, though still down in the student level of filmmaking. It's my Kubrick impression, I hope you like. United Artists didn't say much about the film's quality, but they did like how economical it was, and they asked Kubrick to do a cheap 100k quickie for them as their next project. Said project would be The Killing, and that film is going to be where we start to see more of the Kubrick that we've been expecting. <laughs>